Now we have a look at the storage. Memory is in stored by dendritic connections, in other words, dendritic growths, uh, which are stimulated by dopamine. So it's a bit like making a CD. Uh, we've actually got to make up a network in there and put those impressions in. So a newborn child has a number of neurons in there. We used to think it was finite. By 16 weeks in utero, the brain was fully developed. Um, we're not quite so sure on that now <coughs> because there's evidence that neuronal growth can continue, but most of the neurons are developed by 16 weeks, which is an important aspect of time to remember the first four months of pregnancy is when we need to stimulate neuronal growth as much. But you can see at two years of age, there's not more neurons, but there's more dendrites. So the learning is speeded up. And that's what that little slide of Glenn Doman showed, is in the first four years of life, especially the first two years of life, we never learn as much information as then. The vast quantity of <coughs> bytes of information that go into us are just absolutely and utterly phenomenal. So the two-year-old just has more dendrites. And the extraordinary thing is that Einstein's, when after he died and they did an autopsy on his brain, he didn't have any bigger brain than you and I. Okay? But he had more dendrites. And the reason is he stimulated his brain all his life. So he kept his brain as active all right the way through his life um, because he grew more and more dendrites. So as we lose neurons, we don't have to lose our memory or our ability. We just make more feelers to find the information out, which is great news. Now, of course, we know that we do develop new neurons. Unfortunately, not at the rate that we want to, in, as opposed to degeneration, but we do. So neurogenesis is now a different thing altogether, a possibility. And brain plasticity, of course, <laughs> where we can develop neuronal networks which we haven't used. You know, people say oh, we haven't used 10% in a lifetime of our neurons. I was listening a few months ago to a neurologist on the Today program, and she said, oh, yes, you have. This is all rubbish that you don't use your brain. You use your brain in part, but not for very much. Um, and that may be right. Glenn Doman always said we lose, we're lucky if we use a thousandth in his opinion, of our brain in a lifetime. But what the modern research seems to indicate is that you do, but you don't use those circuits very much. But when you lose your major circuits, you can bring these other ones in, these bypass circuits. So in other words, if the, let's say for instance, the road here into the hotel was closed for some reason, the road up into the hotel, you'd simply go around the back and come in the back entrance. And that's what people do who have therapy to stimulate neuronal no networks, in other words, stimulate neuroplasticity, as it's called, to get the brain to recover. They've still got the problem, but they are able to use other neurons, other circuits. So as long as you fire those circuits at least once, they've, they've made those formation of that network and can be retaught. So we make dopamine from the amino acid tyrosine, and the substance in between is called L-dopa. So tyrosine is hydroxylated by tyrosine hydroxylase to L-dopa, and then L-dopa goes on to make dopamine. Remember this is in the terminal end of the nerve. This is not the same dopamine that's made in your adrenal glands. Well, it is, but it, the dopamine made in your adrenal glands doesn't flow into your brain and stimulate your dopaminergic neurons. You have to make this locally on site. So to convert L-dopa into dopamine, we need pyridoxal 5-phosphate, or the active form of B6, so we need B6 here, and sometimes we can use thiamine as an alternative to B6. And the cofactors to getting this decarboxylation enzyme working is our old friend zinc and magnesium. So in this pathway, we've got B6, magnesium, and zinc, which are the top three substances that you guys prescribe and have done for the last 25 years that I've been in nutritional supplement business uh, because we know those are the three substances that sell most not just with my patients that require it, but your patients, and also the patients in Australia, America, Canada, Russia, they're all the same. So magnesium and zinc are mainly due to intensive farming. It's becoming more and more depleted in the soil, and more and more people are developing problems with B6, and because they're refining the sources, and the major source of B6, is, of course, is whole grains <coughs> and liver. And people don't eat offal or organ meats very much uh, these days, and they tend to have refined or rancid oils within their grains. So they either have refined and white bread and so on, or they have whole grain, which has gone rancid before it's been made into flour. This first pathway of tyrosine to L-dopa 
is dependent upon one of the coenzymes of folic acid called H4 tetrahydrobioptrin and requires oxygen. So we'll see that anything that requires oxygen will be subject to problems with hypoxia. So if we have low levels of oxygen, so we're not no oxygen, otherwise we wouldn't be around, but if we've got slightly lower than optimal levels of oxygen, we may, may not may get a lot of nerves to work properly. So neuro, um, nutrients to consider will be the folates here, um, uh, B5, uh, B6, peridoxal 5-phosphate, possibly thiamine as an alternative, magnesium and zinc. And this is interesting, I go back to here, because the thing that stimulates tyrosine hydroxylase is actually vitamin D. So it's not just the sunshine, but it's the fact the sunshine actually makes vitamin D when the sunshine is high enough up, which is in now in exactly 14 days' time. Remember, on the 21st of March, it'll be up to 45 degrees. And for one minute at midday, you will get 290 nanometers of ultraviolet B, which will be enough to penetrate five layers of skin and make you vitamin D. And you will all have a feeling of spring here, here okay, as a result. Because it's not just the broadness of the light, the broad spectrum light, but it's the fact you actually will start to synthesize vitamin D and a lot of other things, as we'll see in the body. So this is actually stimulated by vitamin D. So therefore, in the winter time, a lot of people get low dopamine. Now, dopamine is a brain chemical which runs the dopaminergic neurons, makes our memory, etc. But it has a lot of other functions. And when you don't have enough dopamine, you feel sad. Okay. And it's a typical type of sad. It's not like low serotonin. And dopamine is a reward neurotransmitter. So if you are rewarded because um, you've done a good job and you feel good about it, that's a dopamine surge. When your football team this afternoon wins, you get a surge okay, of dopamine. Okay? And if one person gets that surge, the whole room will get the surge. Clive, if you stand up this afternoon when Dublin win or the Irish win at rugby, do they play rugby in um, I think I think they do, don't they? Yes. Okay, if I, if I don't win the rugby, there will be a huge surge in the front row here. And we'll all feel better for them, unless, of course, they were playing our team and we lost. So if we lose, that's low serotonin. Okay, that's the blues, if you like. We feel really, really disappointed on that. And that's called the blues. And the reason it's called the blues is in the winter time, the sun is low down in the, in the horizon, even when it comes up there, and it doesn't have the via end of the spectrum. So you get mostly blue, and that's why it's called the blues. So the blues is because blue is a depressing color in mid-range blue, um, but the violet end of the blue is a stimulating one. Okay, so nutrients to consider, uh, the folates and B6 and thiamine, magnesium, zinc. So the recall depends upon information from the frontal cortex to the hippocampus, and this is mainly communication between the septum and the hippocampus. And this Neuronal, uh, neuronal circuitry here of bringing information in from the frontal cortex and that um, was actually first worked on by Francis Crick, who um, was with Watson was the uh, identifier of the double helix of the DNA. Now we're going to come across Francis Crick again later on this afternoon because of another major discovery that he made um, to do with neuronal um, function. He was actually worked on most of his latter years on neuronal uh, neuroscience rather than DNA. So we make acetylcholine, and again we come across this quite a number of times. We make it from its name acetylcholine, which means we make it from choline and from acetyl. So the choline comes from choline, which is a non-essential vitamin B, which is not, doesn't have a number, it's, it is a vitamin B. It doesn't have a number because we can make it in the human body. Now, mostly we get it from tissues which have contained phosphatidylcholine, which is a, a phospholipid in the cell membranes of practically every cellular structure that we eat. Uh, but we can make it possibly by bacterial fermentation in the gut and in the liver itself. This is naturally present in a lot of um, uh, fish, particularly salmon, and the yolks of egg. And choline has a wonderful property of actually lowering triglycerides and cholesterol level. It's called a lipotrophic factor. So choline is something which the body can make and it can get for, from its food. And that's why it lost its status of having a B number. 
So the vitamin Bs that have a number like one, etc., are because you have to get those from the food. We are anyway unable to make it. Now this is really, really important, as we're going to see a bit later on, in that developing child between one and four months, and postnatally for the first three months, because that's when we lay down our acetylinergic neurons, which are responsible for the memory. So you can now see the importance of this, because this could give a child optimal memory. If you've got a child that does not have optimal memory and cannot recall information that it's put in and stored, it's going to have problems with exams. And that is an expensive business. You know, tutoring children privately or having them fail exams time and time again is very, very expensive at that end of the life. For the sake of ten pounds of buying a pot of choline during the pregnancy and the early first three months postpartum. It is really a very, very good sound investment. As, and we'll see why on rat experiments in a moment. The second component, the acetyl part, comes from acetyl-CoA, which is made in making energy. So when we make energy, the first part, glycolysis, makes pyruvic acid or pyruvate. And then this goes into the mitochondria to produce acetyl-CoA. And that's acetyl-CoA in the energy pathway is what makes, uh, links with the choline, and its byproduct is CoA, or the active form of B5, and acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is made from the acetyl-CoA that we make in energy. So if we have problems with making energy, we then can't make acetylcholine, right? which then means that we can't recall. So tired people, tired kids who are going to take their exams, will be tired, and they won't be able to recall. Okay? You've got to keep the kid active. Okay? You mustn't let them sleep or get lethargic, because the tireder they are, the less recall they have. It makes exams and us uh, very extremely hard. So here we've got acetylcholine. Now, for every neurotransmitter we make, we have to get rid of it. Otherwise, it will build up and it will continue to fire that particular neuron. So an example of acetylcholine is it works on the neuromuscular junction of all muscles, all voluntary muscles in the body. So if we don't break acetylcholine down, you continue to get twitching. Okay, so you'll get fasciculation or twitching of the muscles. We get it in the eyelid, we get it here and there. And this is because you've got high levels of acetylcholine, which are not being recycled back to choline and reuptake and acetate. And this chemical that does this is an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And this enzyme is B2 and B3, manganese and zinc dependent. But mostly, and most important, is that it's inhibited, this enzyme, by pesticides, toxic metals, radiation, and galantamine, okay, which is an extract from daffodil bulbs, um, which has been used therapeutically to keep acetylcholine levels high in people, who got, in people who've got memory problems. So this works pharmaceutically. So a pharmaceutical tends to work by blocking an enzyme from working. So this may work, and other drugs work uh, pharmaceutically to maintain high levels of acetylcholine for a person who's got memory problems. We would say, well, that's not the functional way that Chris taught us. What we want to do is to find out why we're not making acetylcholine and build that pathway up, rather than stopping the breaking down of it. But this is how the medication works. And interestingly, pesticides, toxic metals, and radiation also work to inhibit those enzymes. So there's the receptor. Um, the two receptors for um, acetylcholine we have the musculin receptor occurs, and this runs the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, at the moment, we're not interested in the parasympathetic nervous system receptors. We're interested in the nicotinic receptor that occurs in the central nervous system, especially around the hippocampus, for the memory recall, along with the neuromuscular junctions. So all the neuromuscular junctions in the body are run by acetylcholine, but they've got nicotinic acid receptors as opposed to muscarinic. That means that nicotinic receptors can be assessed by the sustained muscle test. Okay, so Anna, do you want to come back down? So that means that if we do a contracted muscle and we hold it, not in the way that we do the traditional holding for one to two seconds and then uh, apply that little extra pressure that we do in kinesiology, what we're going to do is we're going to hold it and with maximum contraction, you go up against me, uh, so we're isometric, and we're just, I'm just going to have a sort of a sit here and uh, wait and see how long you can hold it. And if she can go 10 or 12 seconds, which she can, she's fine. Okay? That means her neuromuscular junctions arrive, 
her nicotinic receptors are okay, acetylcholine is levels okay, your mind is okay. Okay? So one of the fastest ways to test a person's mind or their memory recall is how long can they hold their strength. So what I want you to all do is to make a fist uh, with the person next to you. Right? Make a fist. <laughs> okay, go back into extension a little bit, and then the other person gets hold of the rest, and you push backwards against me, and I'm going to go, 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 and stop you from going into extension, and just see how long you can hold that for. You should be able to hold it for 10 to 12 seconds. Now, I want the person who can't hold it. <laughs> You're fine. You've, you've got one that gives. Okay, we've got a, a candidate. Yes. <laughs> well, you, you might be the person. The only unfortunate thing is you've got a dress like a skirt on. Um, this class is too much. Are you sure? Okay. Because I will use your leg muscle, but yeah. fold your skirt in. All right. Okay, what's your name? Jane. Jane. Okay, so we have a, um, a person here who, how long do you reckon she could hold it for? Four or five seconds. So let's do the wrist one, which is how you were picked out from the group. So wrist into extension. You can do this with any muscle. It doesn't have to be the wrist extensors. Uh, but you push against me, max me. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. Okay. That's almost a, what we would call a functional myasthenia gravis. In other words, an inability for that neuromuscular contraction to be for very long. Okay? We could do it with the um, sustained test here. Um, is that all right with it? Interesting. Okay, so I'm going to use the uh, rectus femoris here. So pull up to your shoulder against me here. So I'm pulling, 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 pulling. Same thing, four, about four seconds, something like that, in that region. This is wonderful <laughs> for, for, for me, but not for you, okay? Okay, so let's you stay there and have a rest, because you need it. <laughs> okay, so natural sources of acetylcholine. In other words, could we get acetylcholine in from outside? Yes, but the chances are it'll be split up in the gut by the enzymes, but at least you'll get the, the acetyl part from the B5, and you'll probably also get the codeine. So they're good components. At least you've got the building blocks to build it. And you get this in a range of herbs and spices, naturally. Fennel, coriander, black pepper, hawthorn. And you know hawthorn, that really gives the strength to the heart and so on. It's one of the ways it does. Fenugreek, cardamom, and stinging nettle, interestingly. Have a good waft of some stinging nettle. Not only do you get a good histamine response, but you get the acetylcholine response as well. Okay. Now, things that block the production of acetylcholine, and this is the really important stuff, are the solanines, the deadly nightshade foods. These work by inhibiting the acetylcholine transferase enzyme to put the acetyl and the choline together. And this is your tomatoes, your potatoes, your bell peppers, aubergine, chili, and tobacco. Now, potatoes is the number one. Okay. Now, it's the green, the solanine is the green on the potato, which is just underneath the skin. And very often you don't see this until you peel the potato. Okay, now this is deadly stuff for green people. So people, biologically or constitutional-wise, who are green, weakened to the green acetate, which you're familiar with, have sensitivities because genetically they don't have the cytochrome P450 enzymes to break the deadly nightshade or the solanine alkaloid down. Okay. Now this is not an allergy. It's an accumulated chemical toxin that inhibits your acetylcholine production. Do you eat these foods? Some of them. Some of them, okay. Um, okay, Will, are you going to have a potato at lunchtime? <laughs> no, very sensible, okay. So remember, you don't often see this in the shop, in the bag. And the reason is they cover the potatoes at night time so the potatoes aren't exposed to the light because the light stimulates the production. This is why when you dig your potatoes up from the ground, if you grow them, and you put them on the lawn to dry, very often the next day they've gone green. Okay? And this, is unfortunately, is why new potatoes are worse than old potatoes. And because they leave them out in the sun to dry them off before they bag them, and they're really high in solanine. And what I get, and Jill, you get it to some extent, although you're not a grain, is when we used to teach a lot in Athens a few years back, by Sunday night we could hardly you know, climb up onto an airplane to get home. It? it was awful, the pain, the agony. It was as if you'd been running up and downstairs all weekend. And it was because the Greek salad, which is so nice, 
and especially those aubergine dips and the peppers and the potatoes and the tomatoes, of course. The amount coming in to me was just over the top. And all my neuromuscular junctions are giving up the ghost by that time. So I know how you feel. You know. <laughs> the uh, neuromuscular junctions also, I know this is working, this, this paralyzes the effect of making acetylcholine on the muscarinic receptors as well. So you find that you need the parasympathetic to constrict the pupil so you can begin to see closer up. So I would find my vision would be bad. You know, I could see longer distances, but my vision close up was awful because the pupil was too dilated and because of all these tomatoes and aubergines and things, right? Because it, it works on the, v on the parasympathetic nervous system as well. So this is why what happens is if I put potato on you, I almost guarantee you'll, you'll go weak very quickly because your level's probably high. Potatoes, tomatoes, etc. And this, of course, was our secret weapon in the Olympics when we won so many Olympic medals, <laughs> is we put McDonald's in as the only foods that they could have with the chips. But the British athletes were not allowed them. <laughs> all right? Only everybody else was allowed the chips because they had high levels of solanine, which meant the, all the rest of the world couldn't run properly. So we won our medals that way. <laughs> okay. So nutrients necessary to make acetylcholine. Choline, of course, which I said. Salmon is a very good source. Uh, egg yolks, etc. Acetyl, the um, uh, active parts of B5. But to make a CoA, the active coenzyme of B5, we need B6 and magnesium, and we'll see we need ATP as well. We need thiamine, and this is interesting here to make acetylcholine. We need thiamine, which is B1, and it's this form of active form here is thiamine triphosphate, and we need manganese. No potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, aubergines, and chilies. Right, so now are you ready? Mm. Okay, so now we're going to do two memory checks. We're going to do a long-term memory check and a short-term. So the long-term one is, you can choose here. I want you to remember the first day. Did you go to college or university? What? University. You remember which one you went to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What I want you to do is in a non-threatening, and this is the important thing, that the challenge is non-threatening. I don't want her to think of an accident that she had or anything which she'll go weak to anyway as a stress. But Sunny, I want you to remember the first day at university. Okay, just you have a, you might just close your eyes and have a think about it. I want you to think about the ways when you arrived at the place, who you saw, what you did. Perfect. All right? You see, she can't really remember. She thinks she does, but okay. <laughs> now, you see what I've done? We could do your 16th birthday. <laughs> no, <laughs> no chance, you see. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, remember the first boy you kissed. <laughs> No, 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 not sure. <laughs> and what colour eyes if, if did he or she have? Uh, you can make innumerable questions here. You know, it doesn't really matter which questions you ask. But they mustn't be stressful. In other words, you don't put in there the first time you fell off your bike or the last time you crashed the car. And, you know. okay. So what we're going to do simply is we're going to go round the three neurological inputs. So triple warmer first. Okay? Remember, triple warmer is, relates to low levels of excitatory neurotransmitters. Did she put the information in? Was she compass mentis or was she high on drugs or something when she went to university? Okay. Go back to university. Close your eyes. Okay, so we're touching therapy, localizing triple warmer 22. No, no difference there. Okay. Did she write the memory? Let's go to the dopamine point of conception vessel 24. In other words, she saw it, she heard it, she went through the door, but did she actually sort of hardwire that? Think of the first thing. No. Okay, so that makes no difference at all. Now we go to gallbladder one, okay, which is, remember, is the acetyl acetylcholine, which is the memory. So think of the first day there. Way, she's there, all right. Okay, you see the difference on that, okay? So immediately, that's the connection, okay? Doesn't mean she's got to walk around like this <laughs> every time she wants to recall the memory of going to the university. What we want to know is what do we give her? So if you'd like to get out the nutrients here, and let's see what happens if we just pop on the three major ones. So we'll put on CoA, or well, let's put on acetyl-CoA. That's in the master nutrition box. Well, let's put on acetyl-choline first of all, shall we? That's from the, from the, I got them all out for you. Oh, so, okay. So what we do is we'll get a, this is a file of the frequency of acetyl-choline. So what I want you to do is to go back, remember that first day, and you see she's strengthened. So that verifies the same as her touching gallbladder one. Okay. Now what we do is acetyl-CoA. 
which is in the B5 division of the Master Nutrition Box. Okay. So acetyl-CoA is one of the active forms of B5. So what we do is we make CoA and then it becomes acetylated. So think of the first day there. So interestingly, acetyl-CoA does do nothing there. So let's try choline. So we've got choline. Okay, close your eyes. Now choline strengthens her. Okay. So this is good. So you need a salmon for lunch. You've been eating salmon. <laughs> is it funny, isn't it, how instinct plays that role, isn't it? Egg okay. yolks. Egg yolks, yeah. That's good, one. excellent, yeah. Have, Have another one. I've got one we'll in the room. We'll <laughs> pop up, we've got one in the room. We'll pop a fi <laughs> fried egg or uh, an egg yeah. on there. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so what we've got is the situation. Have you got some thiamine triphosphate there? It'll be thiamine in the B1. Okay, we'll just try thiamine as well. Obviously, this is not how you would come and see me and I would treat you, right? But I want to just demonstrate the links. Okay, close eyes, think of the first day at university. So B1 is fine as far as thiamine. Okay, so we now got a clue in anyway, okay? So at the end of the day, what we want to do is to find out all the things that will strengthen you. So that'll bring strength back in. In fact, if you give me the choline, again, what we do is we just do another sustained muscle contraction, shall we? Remember she was about four seconds. Are you ready for this? Don't think back at college, just open your eyes. Okay, right, pull. Okay, take that away. Pull. <laughs> okay, so you go and have another egg now. Yeah, okay. okay. Egg and salmon. Okay, fine. Thank, Thank you. you. So that had to be non-threatening. Okay, <coughs> remember, so you can make up any anything you want there. It could be your fifth birthday, whatever. All right? Now let's do one for everybody. Uh, okay, everybody, this one. So now you think, why did he advertise his company at the beginning? Why did he emphasize the telephone number? Very strange, that's not like Chris. Right. Okay, so how many published articles on epigenetics are currently on PubMed? Anybody remember? Three. 360,000, any, do I hear advances on that? <laughs> okay. No. If you play the film back, you'll see that I actually mentioned all of these several times, okay? I have repeated it. But not in a way that I wanted to make it too obvious. Perhaps I did make it too obvious. Okay. Right. In which year was epigenetics founded? 2012. Good. Okay. And what is the telephone number? Oh. <laughs> Good. Well done. Okay. okay. You're not sure? Not 800 and something. Else. <laughs> right. Okay. So what we did, like with Jane, is we did the challenge and then we crossed therapy localized to the triple woman 23 for the input. We crossed, if that didn't work, okay, there was no change to that. We did conception vessel 24 for the writing of the disc and then we went to GB1. Now, with GB1, it's the more common, probably eight out of 10 is that. Sometimes if it's the first one, triple woman 23, in other words, the neurological input then what you would do is those five senses like I did with Anna, okay? Because you want to find out where is the problem. And the problem may not be where you think it is, okay? So you think, oh, I wonder if they didn't see it, didn't hear it. And you could be shouting at a person and they really don't understand. But it could be one of the other senses which has caused problems in, uh, in, in remote inputs, okay? So test them all through and then do them again and again and again if one follows the next. So sometimes you do taste comes up and then <coughs> hearing comes up next time. And then vision. And uh, Jill had one where they swap sides, you know, continually. Uh, so, you know, some people find I neurological input or sensory input very, very difficult, really scrambled. So at least we can unscramble that. Conception vessel uh, 24 is low dopamine. So these people have got a lack, up of lack of reward. They don't feel worthy in things in themselves. You know, they, they really uh, hold on. Um, David Hawkins said it was uh, grief and regret, so it's difficult in, in uh, uh, parting with things. And if it's the third one, 
then you will find that the neuromuscular junction is not going to survive for more than four or five seconds. It's weak because the neuromuscular junction acetylcholine is the same acetylcholine receptors as in the hippocampus and the memory. So challenge, therefore, for negating nutrients and or anything else of the different factors which may have an effect. Good. So epigenetics, were quite right. 2012. I put it back on again so you don't forget this time. Right. 2012. I, I even put it in yellow. Okay? This is the intensity of it. Okay? Glenn Doman used to say red is the best color. Uh, if you put it in, in black and white in printing, but you put it in red, it actually stands out more to the red cones uh, because we have red cones. We don't have yellow cones. Yellow is a combination of red and green. So maybe here, green is a particularly not difficult, not an easy color. So yellow does stand out, I find, here. Um, but Glenn always said red was the best color to bring out. See, with his flashcards, when he used to give them to children and flash up, you know, cards with dots on them and things, they were always in red with a white background. PubMed now has 386,000 published articles. Did anybody get that right? Oh, good, good. Excellent. And epigenetics number is 01380. No 800 in there. 800105. Okay, so how many got that right? Oh, good. Excellent. So how many got all three right? One. <laughs> well, well done. Okay, excellent, excellent. Right, so if I went back on that, and 2012, 386,000, 0130, you're hearing it again and again and again, all right? And that's how we learn. Okay, so if you think, well, actually, I can't remember, I'll never remember, just keep doing it. Gary and I were playing with, or I was playing, trying to do something on Photoshop the other day, and Gary was my mentor many years ago, and then I haven't used Photoshop for a long time. I said, I don't know, I'm going to have to write all these down. You know, the process of doing this, this, that, transform this, and over there, and that. And he said, oh, don't worry. I said, this is going to take me all day, at least, to put in all these slides. And he said, no, no, you'll be whizzing through it in no time. And it was true. After two or three times of doing it, I could do it without looking at any of the notes. And uh, I was terrified I'd lose it or put it in the wrong place and press the wrong button and so on. But it was right. You know, eventually I did 53 slides out in a couple of hours, which would... Normally, you know, I thought oh, this is going to take me all day. So repetition is the key. So this is an article written um, some years ago now about uh, two uh, professors in the Department of Experimental Psychology uh, that gave choline to the diet in rats at a time when the cholinergic cells are being formed to make the synaptic connections in the brain. This is in rats. So the cholinergic ones, remember, are the ones that give you the memory. So spatial awareness is one of those um, very, very important ones. So remembering where you are um, is really, really important. So, you know, one of the things sometimes my children ask me, is that, um, they say, how do you remember where to drive? How do you know the road so well? I said, well, you just do. You recognize the trees, the places you are, where you're going. How do you do that? <laughs> because cause they haven't put all that information, they haven't had to put that information because they don't drive. I said, well, when you drive, you just will put that information in through repetition. Okay, so cholinergic cells are special because they need choline to make acetylcholine, um, but like all cells, also require choline to maintain their cell membranes, in other words, the phosphatidyl choline. Thus, choline cells doubly require choline, said Dr. Holmes, um, in supplemented pregnant rats with choline in their drinking water. This task tapped into the working and reference memories. Amazing enough, the rats which had prenatal and postnatal, or both prenatal and postnatal supplementation of choline, made fewer mistakes in their first day of training. That was their day of training as, as young rats. And the choline animals continued, continued to perform better than the control rats, even as adults. Whoa, that's important, isn't it? So in other words, by feeding the choline, you're not going to super greenhouse a kid. But what you will do is bring the optimal out in their neuronal development. And that's important, isn't it? Because if that kid, when they get to 16 and things, is doing GCSEs, and they haven't got optimal, then their life is always going to be hard. But at least you will be supporting them enough to give them the neural networks to make learning easy as a child, uh, or as a child and as an adult. Because some kids find it, 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 it's impossible to learn. It's so difficult for them, because they haven't got the wiring mechanism in there at the time. And other people, kids, it, right, it's easy, don't they? Oh, they read a book once and that's it. They can reproduce anything. You know, I have friends, 
used to do their A-levels, never did any work. You know, I used to have to study and study and study to learn anything for A-levels. And about once every five years, I still get a nightmare, I'm taking an A-level, and I haven't done any, any work for it. <laughs> and you feel such an idiot going to the exam and you don't know what the, what the questions even mean. And then I wake up and think, oh, thank heaven it was a dream. Okay, so uh, they perform better as adults. Uh, in fact, rats which had both pre- and postnatal supplementation occurring demonstrated the greatest amount of permanent improvement in their memory capacity and precision. Since those experiments were completed, sensitive periods of time of administration have been determined uh, in the first, obviously, months of pregnancy. This is in rats, and the first 30 days afterwards. Again, this is rat months. The former period occurs when all the cholinergic neurons in the f in the basal forebrain form. So the first time in the first four months of in humans will be as the brain forms. The latter period also seems to be highly significant because this is when these developing rats are being weaned, in other words, in their breast milk. Synaptic connections are being made in the hippocampus and the cortex, which are the critical areas in visual spatial learning and memory. Okay? So in other words, the first four, four months, th there's no problem with taking choline right the way through to be on the safe side. But what we suggest is that in human years, it will be the first four months of pregnancy and the first three months of neonatal life. So if it's to the baby, you put it into, if they are on formula milk, you put it in there. But otherwise, you give it to the mother, of course, to come through, which is much better, of course, than breast milk. So prescribe 1,500 milligrams of choline by tartrate, which is the most soluble form, which will deliver 600. It's 40% it's choline, 60% tartrate. So it will deliver 600 milligrams of actual elemental choline. So you would need three capsules, in other three 500 milligram capsules will give you 600, which is considered to be the optimal amount during pregnancy and after. So, you know, for the sake of, you know, a very small amount, 10, 20 pounds, you're ensuring an optimal development as far as the cholinergic neurons, which is important. So we're coming towards um, break time. So I'm going to just go through very quickly neurotransmitters before we break. And neurotransmitters are the chemicals that link the terminal end of one nerve to the other. Okay, so this is how nerves talk to each other using chemicals. So what I've talked about already is that we have uh, a series of neurotransmitters which are made in the terminal end of the nerve. Okay, that's the distal end of the nerve. And the nerve becomes depolarized, in other words, it loses its negative charge when a positive goes into the beginning of the nerve. Okay, and that beginning of the nerve to start that is usually sodium or calcium that enters in. This reverses the negativity or depolarizes the nerve, so the charge goes down the central axon to the terminal end. And it's the terminal end that we're really interested in because that's where we make our neurotransmitter. Now we have three types of neurotransmitters. We have excitatory ones, which open those channels or the door up and allow multiple depolarizations to occur because sodium and, um, sodium and calcium in flux, uh, less controlled. Stimulatory ones, like acetylcholine, which only allow one ion, usually a sodium, to enter. And inhibitory ones, like GABA, which allow chlorine to enter, rather than sodium. And chlorine has a negative charge, so that nerve then becomes doubly negative, or hyperpolarized, so that it doesn't discharge. Okay? And that's why it's called an inhibitory nerve. So you actually have to stimulate an inhibitory nerve not to fire. Now, half our brain are inhibitory and half are excitatory and stimulatory. So there's a list of the different ones, and I put a, a star on the ones that we're interested in today, glutamic acid, acetylcholine, and dopamine. So I'm going to whip through this. That's about the, the voltage in the nerve normally is minus 70 millivolts, and then we depolarize when the plus goes in, and so we become positive in the uh, voltage there. Um, stimulatory neurotransmitters allow sodium enter. Um, glutamic acid and um, aspartate allow calcium as well in there. We have to pump all this out, otherwise we turn to stone in the neuron. And this turning to stone is called transneural degeneration. Uh, things that can stimulate transneural degeneration is a lack of activity. The brain is a particularly, if you don't use it, you lose it. Okay, this is the motto with all neurology. So deafferentation, if you don't stimulate it or create the afferentation in. Infection, meningitis, obviously, serious problem. Allergy, 
and particularly things like gluten, etc., have profound effects on, uh, on brain function. Toxicity, especially things like toxic metals, etc., and of course nutritional deficiency, especially of the fatty acids uh, of DHA, EPA, etc. Um, so once the neurotransmitter is manufactured or synthesized, it has to be um, metabolized or broken down to its components, and then these are retaken up, called reuptake. Uh, to be taken back into the terminal end of the nerve and recycled. And we'll just finish this part off with doing that. So this is a cholinergic neuron, in other words, one which operates acetylcholine. So we see here we've got acetyl-CoA. Uh, so we're using here um, choline here and acetyl-CoA coming together to make ACH or acetylcholine. Now, at this point, we then store that acetylcholine in little uh, vesicles. Okay? So these are little bubbles. This is the neuronal membrane. This is the membrane around the nerve. Okay? And these are the bubbles where the neurotransmitter is stored, ready for instant action. So as the nerve then depolarizes here, uh, these bubbles move towards the cell membrane and blend with the cell membrane and therefore discharge their contents, in other words, the acetylcholine, into the synapse. Right? So one very, very important thing is that the bubble, the vesicle, has to be made of the same component as the cell membrane. So if you bake bubbles in your bath, okay, one bubble can merge with another bubble, can't it? Okay, and make a bigger bubble. Okay? But if one bubble is made of something else, like a ping pong ball, it's not going to merge with a bubble in the bath, is it? Okay? And this is what happens. So if your membranes are made of different oils, okay, and worst of all, if they're made of rubbish oils, okay, in other words, those oils are acting with too high a melting points, like trans fatty acids, heated vegetable oils, oxidized fatty acids, um, hydrogenated vegetable oils in your brain, that's not good. Now the principle, as Jill will teach us, the principal fatty acid of here is DHA, the cosahexaenoic acid, and that is also the principal fatty acid in the vesicle. So if you've got a deficiency of DHA at the synapse, these two simply can't merge. So you can make all the acetylcholine you want, but if it won't discharge into the synapse, it won't work. So a lot of people's problems are they've got hardened membranes. Okay? And this is why fish oil is so good for some people, because it helps to get the oils right, and then they begin to, the brains begin to work. But fish oil doesn't suit everybody, as we'll see. Uh, by any means. So what we do is we incorporate the acetylcholine into there, then we discharge it into the synapse here, and then this diffuses across to the uh, ion channel gate, or the doorway in the next nerve, okay, and allows the sodium or calcium to go in, in this case it would be sodium. We then dissociate this by the enzyme that breaks acetylcholine down, called acetylcholine esterase, and this is then recycled back into the terminal end of the nerve to reuse the components. So we make our neurotransmitter uh, and metabolize it. it. It opens up and we metabolize it. And this distance between here is minute. This is w widened out to make it look like a big gap. But nerves don't actually, they're not apart, but they also don't link. You know, they have to have that, that chemical link to combine the two. And here we see the actual ion channel here. So you see it's like a docking gate. So this would be where the sodium, in this case, will go in, and if it's an excitatory neurotransmitter, this will be where calcium goes in also. Okay? And then that enters the next cell inside there. And we'll see here we've got a gate, and we've got a neurotransmitter recognition site or voltage sensor on the front. So as we open the docking gates up here, and remember in the excitatory ones, this will be magnesium, and this will be zinc. So deficiencies of zinc magnesium or both, will allow more uncontrolled entry of calcium and sodium into the next cell. So you get multiple depolarizations, which would be cause hyperactivity or overstimulation. And it's these voltage sensitive, see what it's called, voltage sensitive, that electromagnetic fields are known to exert at least part of their detrimental effect by opening the voltage-gated ion the calcium channels. In this case, that would be in the excitatory ion. This is why you keep awake when you're close to magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields. Okay? So usually we find this in hotels, don't we? 
So when you sleep in a hotel, you're never far from an electromagnetic field around your bed because you've got the light and the phone. In fact, Gary was saying, and we talked about this this morning, and he said, oh, the light by the side of the bed buzzes in, in your bedroom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if a light buzzes, you know, the chances are there's something electrical going on in there and you're going to get a field. And it's quite interesting how it tells, if you pull the bed away from the wall, how many things you've got behind when your head is resting there. And if they're within a meter of your pineal gland, uh, they will affect your sleep patterns. So this is where electromagnetic fields are thought to exert at least some of their detrimental effects via the voltage-gated calcium channels. And of course, that would be mainly with the excitatory neurotransmitters more than the acetylcholine.